video I'm going to talk about subarachnoid hemorrhage, also abbreviated SAH. Before I get into the symptoms and diagnosis, I'm going to draw a diagram uh, that sort of represents uh, the anatomy of what's uh, involved. So this part is the brain, and then this layer that covers the brain is called the pia matter. This layer here is the arachnoid matter, and then this here is the dura matter. And then this layer here is just the skull. The area that we're uh, interested in is right here, right here. That's where the bleeding occurs. And uh, that area, as you can probably imagine, is known as the subarachnoid space. So that subarachnoid space is where the bleeding occurs. And what are the causes? Why does this happen? There's a couple of reasons. The first is, he first is head trauma. A person with head trauma will definitely can develop a subarachnoid hemorrhage. But another really common is ruptured aneurysms. Uh, ruptured aneurysms uh, can account for uh, up to um, 85% um, of the cases. Now there's two types of aneurysms that are really the culprits. There's this one and there's this one. These are the way they look. They've given special names. This one's called a berry aneurysm. I don't know why, maybe because it was, looks like a berry, I don't know. And this one is called a saccular, S-C-C-U-L-A-R, saccular aneurysm. And those are the two types of aneurysms. Of, they're, they're described based on shape. So why is this important? Why is a subarachnoid hemorrhage important? Well, subarachnoid hemorrhage is very important because it, it can lead to a lot of problems. And here's, here's a a list of things. It can cause meningitis. Okay. It can also cause increase in the intracranial pressure. It can also cause a person to develop brain ischemia where the brain tissue is not getting enough blood. And then it can also cause stroke and cerebral edema. As you can see, all these things can probably kill a patient. Well, now we can get into the symptoms and diagnosis. Well, very severe headache, not just any headache, very, very severe. Another uh, thing is vomiting. Anytime you have vomiting associated with headache, it's bad. It's usually a sign of intracranial pressure. A person can also have loss of consciousness, LOC, and then also they can present with neurologic deficits. Uh, when you do the, for example, you know, you all do those cranial nerve exams. All right, now let's talk about the diagnosis. How is this diagnosed? Well, there's a couple of ways. The two things that you do. The first way is a CT, and in particular, a non-contrast CT. Okay, why non-contrast? Because contrast on a CT appears white, and blood on a CT, contrast appears white. Blood on a CT also appears white. So if you did a CT with contrast, you wouldn't be able to tell what's the contrast and what's the blood, so you do a non-contrast. And the second way, is by doing a lumbar puncture to obtain a sample of CS, CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. Okay? Now, if it was that simple, you know, with this whole CSF thing, you wouldn't be able to have any board questions, but it's not that simple because there's a couple of issues here that we need to talk about. And we need to talk about, I'm going to draw a line here, and uh, we're going to talk about CSF from a lumbar puncture. Okay, that is from subarachnoid hemorrhage, and CSF from a traumatic lumbar puncture. Now, think about this for a second. Person has person has subarachnoid hemorrhage. You do the CSF, you you do the lumbar puncture, and you obtain a sample of CSF, and you put it in a test tube. Is this going to have blood in it? Well, yes, it will, because a person has subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, let's say I'm going to draw, I'm going to make it red just to show. Now, let's say you do a, a lumbar puncture on a person who doesn't have subarachnoid hemorrhage. But during the lumbar puncture, you, you cause some trauma, cause some bleeding. Is the person going to have blood in the CSF? Yeah, they will. Well then how do you know if this is a subarachnoid hemorrhage or is it a traumatic lumbar puncture?
Well, there's a couple ways, and that's what I really wanted to talk to you about. So let's see if we can figure this out. Uh, let's just erase the whole thing. All right. All right, let's see. So we got CSF from subarachnoid hemorrhage, CSF from traumatic spinal tap. Okay? All right. There's a couple ways. The first way is by taking and comparing the tubes. Now, let's say you, you drew four test tubes. Okay? This is the first one. This is the second one. This is the third one. This is the fourth one. Well, the, the blood, the red blood cells will be about the same if you were to measure the content of the red blood cells in the CSF sample. Okay? Let's say this is the CSF sample. But something interesting happens with uh, traumatic uh, spinal taps, whereas is if you took the samples, the amount of red blood cells in each successive sample would be less. See, this is in chronologic order. This was the first one that you drew. This was the second test tube. This was the third uh, tube. This was the fourth. That's one way of differentiating. Another way to differentiate the two is something called centrifuging. You take a sample and you centrifuge. You spin it. And when you spin it, it separates the liquid from the precipitate. Okay, this is this bot bottom part here is precipitate. And what's this part here? It's the fluid, but do you remember the name? There's a special name, super, supernatant, right. Well, here's the story. In a CSF that from a subarachnoid hemorrhage, this CSF supernatant will be yellow. And it will not be yellow if it's a traumatic spinal tap. Now, I would like to explain why. It's kind of important to explain why. Why is this happening? Well, here's the story. When a person has a subarachnoid hemorrhage, so I'll draw a little red blood cell here, R, B, C, so someone has a subarachnoid hemorrhage there's blood inside the subarachnoid space the red blood cells eventually lyse and then they release these hemoglobin molecules okay hemoglobin and then the hemoglobin is hit by oxygen and then it becomes oxyhemoglobin okay then what happens is you have an enzyme an enzyme called heme oxygenase okay and that eventually leads to the production of bilirubin okay this is what causes that yellow color all right now this happens in subarachnoid hemorrhage but it does not happen in the traumatic spinal tap okay it's very important to remember that that uh, the traumatic spinal tap does introduce red blood cells into the CSF and those uh, red blood cells can hemolyze and they can even form oxyhemoglobin. Hemoglobin is not converted to bilirubin in the CSF sample with a traumatic spinal tap. All right, this does not happen uh, with the traumatic spinal tap. So this does not happen, but it does happen with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. All right, so I hope that made sense. Now the final part is just uh, a bit about the treatment. You evacuate the blood and then you occlude or bypass or clip. You occlude or bypass or clip the aneurysm. Uh, but there's one thing that's really important. Uh, the second part is uh, uh, th there's a chemical cascade that I really don't want to get into because it's very complex. But it involves uh, an end result of vasospasm in the, in the, uh, in the cerebral blood vessels. And uh, you want to prevent this. So to prevent this, you have to give you have to give a medication, and that medication is nimodipine. Okay, and as most of you remember, nimodipine is a blood pressure medicine. It, it lowers the pressure inside the blood vessels. So that's a presentation about subarachnoid hemorrhage.